Hello and welcome to the Life and Legacy Show. My name is Tim Seckler from the Seckler Law Firm. I am uh, your host on today's radio show. Uh, this is called the Life and Legacy Show, where we talk about all types of legal things that impact you, your life, your legacy, uh, and the things I think you need to know uh, to do an effective estate plan. And if this is your first time uh, checking out the show, we've been doing this thing weekly now uh, for about 10 months, and so there's all kinds of back episodes available on our podcast, so you can find the show on uh, wherever you find podcasts, Apple, Spotify, whatever it be. And we recently started recording these shows uh, as a video, so we have a YouTube channel, you can find them there. Uh, and I did that, uh, started doing that a few episodes ago, and I had a client that found them, and he said, Tim, you gotta look at the, you gotta look at the camera more. It's not just a radio show anymore, you got a camera there. So Gary, thanks for the tip, I'll look at the camera a little bit more. Uh, but, uh, in my mind, I'm still doing just radio and podcast here. But anyway, if you are, uh, if you're a return listener, I appreciate, uh, you coming back and checking us out and what we have to say. Uh, my job, as I see it, I, I think the lawyer's job is first and primary to educate their clients on the issues they're up against, provide them the education they need to make the, uh, the legal and technical decisions that they need to do what's best for uh, for their family, for your family, um, and uh, and so I provide a ton of free education. You can check out the old podcast for this show. You could go to our YouTube channel. You can check out my blog post articles all over my website. There's pages of them. I think at last count there's something like eight pages of articles on our website. Um, and any uh, and any time you want, you can check out our pre-recorded workshops or come to one of our live workshops. So we are back in person doing our live workshops. They have been very well attended. We've actually had a waiting list on a bunch of them because what we do is we take this big room in, off of Route 228, I'm sorry, 228 up in the Cranberry area and uh, we space everybody out real well and, and do the workshop there. So if you, like a lot of other folks seem to be, are taking the opportunity now that the sun is shining and you feel a little bit safer leaving your house, perhaps you've already been vaccinated, you should come to check out one of our estate planning and elder law workshops. Uh, and if you would also like, again, every month we are running a live webinar so that you can check out some of the things that I have to say about an estate plan and you can ask questions and do whatever uh, note taking you need to do so that you make sure you understand some of the things that I talk about. Uh, in today's episode of this radio show, <clears throat> we are going to uh, we're going to hammer out a bunch of useful information, or at least I hope you find it to be useful information. Um, and my team has been urging me to do this for a while, my uh, and, and that is to do a show on frequently asked questions and, and take some of the questions that we get from uh, the audience at the workshop and from our clients with regard to some of the things that seniors and retirees face uh, in uh, in making an estate planning decision, the, the things they want to know about wills and trusts and powers of attorney. So why not just take my client's most frequently asked questions? And so I got a list of them here, and there's a whole bunch of them, and we're not going to get to all of them today. Perhaps we'll do a follow-up to this episode where, uh, where we tackle even more of them. But... <clears throat> Um, the thing, the thing, the main topic that we talk about <clears throat> in our estate planning workshops is what documents do you need to use? Do you need to use a will or do you need to use a trust and, and what type of trust? And so just before we get into the questions, a little bit of background is estate planning, whether we're talking about a will or a trust or power of attorney, what we're really talking about doing, what we're really managing is control and access. Who's got control of me and my things and who's got access to me and my things when I'm alive and well, when I get sick, if I pass away, who's who's in control of my stuff, who can get to my my stuff and uh, and what is the person who's in control allowed to do? And so we use tools like powers of attorney and wills and trusts to answer those questions. Um, and so, for example, uh, the, uh, one of the questions we get all the time is, do I need a power of attorney? And the answer is, if, if you're an adult and you're breathing, uh, you probably need a power of attorney because any of us could become incapacitated at any point in time. You know, statistically speaking, it's extremely uh, more likely for someone, say, in their 30s to become incapacitated due to an accident or an injury than it is for them to pass away due to an accident or an injury. And so, you know, everybody thinks that estate planning is only about asking the question, who's in control if I pass away? Who gets the stuff if I pass away? But we also have to answer the questions, well, what happens if I get really, really sick? Or what happens if I've got capacity issues due to 
a head injury, for example. Who's going to make the decisions then, right? Because a lot of you think, well, if you're married, or you, your spouse can just make those decisions. But that's not really how it works uh, because you you have to consider how you own your stuff. Uh, if you and your spouse are both joint owners on the checking account <clears throat> and you become incapacitated, yeah, she can get access to the checking account. She's an owner on it. But, but what about your retirement account? She's listed as a beneficiary or your spouse is listed as a beneficiary if you pass away. But what if you're just incapacitated and your spouse wants to get to those retirement account funds to help pay for your care or to make the mortgage payment or to do whatever? And if you don't have a power of attorney, you're in a situation where your family just lost control of the situation. There's nobody that the financial institution is allowed to deal with. Uh, because you fail to appoint someone. And so then families end up in guardianship court and, and my wife would have to have me declared legally incapacitated and then then she could get control of the money. And But, you know, that comes with reporting requirements and that comes with some oversight and, and a, lot of, a lot of my clients seem to not want the government involved to that extent in their life. So um, we need to plan for it. You need to do a power of attorney. But just telling me you have a power of attorney isn't really good enough. Because when, when I review powers of attorney that people bring in, and maybe they did it a while ago with another lawyer, or they printed it off the internet, and they asked me to review it and determine if I think it's a good document, the thing that I'm looking for is uh, often, one of the things that I'm looking for, is the gifting language. Because in a power of attorney, the, uh, the gifting language is super important, especially when we get into a situation where uh, someone's sick and someone goes into the nursing home and we need to be able to protect assets. We, we need to really have a lot of authority in these power of attorney documents. And so one of, one of the things that we sort of harp on with our clients is you gotta do, you gotta do a, a power of attorney and you have to do a power of attorney that has some muscle to it. Because when someone gets sick or when we need to do tax planning or we need to do asset protection planning, that type of more comprehensive planning almost always involves doing some gifting or doing, um, you know, some transfers of assets of some sort. And, and that type of planning needs to be specifically authorized in your power of attorney. And I think I ought to, I ought to take a break to just give you the warning, okay? This show is education and entertainment. This is not legal advice to you. I'm not saying you should draft your own power of attorney. Please don't. You will screw it up. I'm not saying you should tr shred whatever you have. Please don't. That could be a giant mistake. What I'm saying is you need to work with someone who understands this stuff and does it correctly. And if you happen to be worried about things like taxes and long-term care expenses and asset protection, you may want to consider talking to us or talking to someone else who does this stuff about making sure that you have the strong worded gifting language in your power of attorney. Okay, so that is probably enough about powers of attorney today. Let's get to some of these uh, these frequently asked questions about estate planning. Um, and we're gonna keep it today to estate planning documents. I'm not gonna take a deep, deep dive on nursing home law and any of that. For one, it's a half an hour show and that's about a six hour conversation. Uh, and two, we've got lots of other materials on that. And so it can help you anytime you like uh, to get the education. Um, but let's talk about <clears throat> estate planning documents. And, and probably the most common question that we get about estate planning is, should I use a will or should I use a trust? You know, I've, I've done will-based planning or I, I understand what a will is, names who gets my stuff when I pass away and I think I ought to do that or we did it when the kids are little. But, you know, my friends are talking about trusts or I read online that a trust is a situation. Perhaps my financial advisor talked to me about doing a trust. So, should I do a will? Should I do a trust? Is it either or? Do you do both? You know, this is this is kind of a key thing that people come to our workshop to, to really take a deep dive on. I'll, I'll scratch the surface here today. But this can be a fairly complicated decision, and it really depends on, you know, people want to know which one's better. Is a will better than a trust? Is a trust better than a will? And that's that's not the right question to ask. That's not that one is better. The question to ask is, which one works better for me? See, because these tools are just, the, these documents are just tools. Asking if a trust is better than a will is a bit like asking the question, is a screwdriver better than a hammer? Well, I don't know. You know, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to break something? Are you trying to pound a nail? Or are you trying to screw a screw? You know, it, 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 
what are you trying to do? Once we uh, can figure out what we're trying to do, then we can talk about which tool pulls it off the best. Uh, and so it's really tricky to answer the question if, if a will or a trust is better for a client without first getting to know that client a little bit. Um, but here's essentially the difference. What a will does is a will will uh, name who gets the stuff when you pass away and it names who's the executor. That person's kind of in control. Remember, the stuff is all about access and control. So the will names who's in control. That's the executor. Now, the executor can only do what the judge allows them to do. But, uh, you know, the executor makes most of the decisions here. Um, and a will can do some pretty neat stuff. Like, you can do some complicated planning with wills. It's not that every will is, is simple. You know, people come in and say, all I need is a simple will, and how much does it cost? And I'll say, you know, I'll let you know when I write one, because I haven't written one yet that's super simple. Because these, pl these documents do all kinds of things. Um, you know, we need to do underage planning. You need to do disability planning. Like if I pass away, sure, I just want to say everything to my spouse or I want to say most of the things to my spouse. But what happens if my spouse dies in the same accident with me and now the stuff's going to my kids? Well, now my kids, my kids are little, right? So they can't take ownership of the money and I wouldn't want them to. So it has to go to a trust. But that trust that's for the benefit of my kids, what's called an underage trust, is built into the terms of my will. So my will could say, in the event any of the heirs that receive an inheritance are under the age of probably 25 or 30, then hold the money in trust for them until they reach that age, right? So with a will, we not only get to answer the question, what happens when I pass away and who gets it? We also get to answer some questions like, what happens if that person passes before me? What happens if that person is disabled? What happens if that person is underage? What happens if my kid gets the inheritance and then goes through a divorce? You know, are there some things that we could do to protect my kid's divorce from their potential, uh, my kid's inheritance from their potential divorce? And the answer is yes, you can do that kind of stuff with a will. But the will, wills have their shortfalls. Um, and, and there's two that I'm going to chat about right after this brief little in-show commercial for come to one of our upcoming workshops, right? So if you just turned into the show late, my name's Tim Seckler from the Seckler Law Firm. We, uh, our primary office is in Mars, PA. And we, uh, we do this radio show to provide you with some education, but the real education comes in one of our live events, our workshops that we hold monthly, bi-monthly in our office. We also hold them in Newcastle on occasion. Uh, some other areas, and we also have a live webinar. So if you're curious about any of this and you want to take a deeper dive, you want to ask some questions, these workshops are free. You can find all about them at secklerlawfirm.com, S-E-C-H-L-E-R, lawfirm.com, all one word. Uh, and there's a workshops tab, and you can register right there on the website for how you come. Okay, so prior to my little advertisement there, and I, I appreciate your patience, um, we were talking about a couple of the shortfalls of the will. And here's one, the one that's most common and lawyers talk about an awful lot and financial talk, advisors talk about an awful lot is that wills have to go through probate. So when you pass away, uh, the executor of your will has to get sworn in and, and uh, at the courthouse and there's certain requirements you have to do by way of reporting and, and letting the judge and, and the court know what's going on with your affairs. And you're typically going to hire a lawyer to help you with this. And, and the lawyer's fees in Pennsylvania can be based on a percentage of your net worth, somewhere between, say, I don't know, 3 and 6% of your net worth I've seen lawyers charge. And, and that all depends on the size of the estate and stuff. But it can get pretty darn expensive, is, I guess is my point. It can be time consuming and, and, you know, it's sort of a public matter. Now, that doesn't matter to everybody. And the people ask me, you know, Tim, should I avoid probate? And the answer is, yeah, maybe. You know, in my opinion, in lawyers, if you ask 10 lawyers, you're going to get 10 answers here. But in my opinion, all else being equal, if the question was, should I go through probate or is it better to avoid probate? My answer is going to be, you want to avoid probate. Right? Now, there are other states, California comes to mind, where you do not want to go through probate. You, you just don't want to do it. It's super expensive. It takes forever. And they have not done the things that Pennsylvania has done to make some of the probate process a little bit easier. So while Pennsylvania's probate system may be a little bit better than some other states, I still think all else being equal, you know, I would prefer to keep my family out of the courthouse. I spent my whole life trying to stay out of the courthouse. Why would I want to send all my family and my money through the court process on my way out? So people talk about 
one of the shortfalls of wills is when you when you pass away, the will has to be probated and we have to go through the courthouse to get the stuff to the kids. But there's another issue with wills. And, and by the way, I write lots of wills, right? So th there's nothing, this isn't that you should do a trust, right? This is just you should do what's right for you. But one of the shortfalls of wills is that, um, you know, I could write you the world's best will. I could write you a will that has underage planning and incapacity planning and it has what happens if my kid gets divorced planning and it has disability it's got all this planning it has it has everything you could throw into a will it's got power windows and and tilt steering and all these fancy things in there right do car companies even advertise tilt steering anymore i think it's still on the window sticker but anyway so so this will has all of this important stuff but when uh when you pass away the money doesn't go through the will well, wait a minute, Tim, what do you mean the money doesn't go through the will? Well, it depends how you own your stuff. See, a lot of people have their financial assets covered by beneficiary designations, your retirement accounts, your life insurance, annuity contracts, investment accounts. Somewhere along the line, someone, whether it was your financial advisor, your buddy down the street, the guys at work, or the government, in the case of, say, like a, a retirement account, Somebody told you, you should put a beneficiary designation on uh, your stuff. And then that way, when you pass away, you've told your financial institution where to send the money. The money will go straight to the kids or the money will go to your spouse and then to the kids. And you've just told them where to send the money. But the thing is, like, let's say you have a, a, this account at, the, at an investment institution or at the bank. The bank doesn't care what your will says because you have a beneficiary designation, right? Well, that sounds great, except... The only question a beneficiary designation answers is, who gets it when I pass away? But remember, our will had all that complex planning in it. What happens if, I die, if the person dies first? What happens if the person's underage? What happens if the person's disabled? What happens, what happens, what happens? We've got all the, the comprehensive planning in the will. But when people use wills, everybody knows that they're going to send 90% of their money via beneficiary designation and skip the... Uh, the helpful provisions that were provided in the will. Right? And so the problem, they're related, but the biggest problem with wills isn't that they go through probate. Probate's not the end of the world. But the problem is when people use wills, they tend to not send all the money through the will. They tend to use the beneficiary designations because somebody told them that's another way to avoid probate. So we do these beneficiary designations, we skip the will, and then what happens is your family, when you pass away, could be going through one of these harmful times. A, a kid, you know, your kid dies before you, or somebody's disabled, or somebody's underage, or your kid's going through a divorce, or your kid's been sued and has creditor issues, or your kid's drinking or gambling, or any other issues that really blow up families and take away your financial trophy of your life's hard work. Those issues that blow up your family's situation, if you leave all of your money beneficiary designated, then when your money's going to the kids, it's a little bit like dumping gasoline on whatever fire is occurring in your kid's world. It just gets worse. It just blows up worse. And so there's a reason in a will that we put all these helpful provisions in there because if something's happened to your family, we've got an answer for that but it doesn't do us any good if you leave all the money for beneficiary designations. So people want the ease and use of beneficiary designations because they avoid probate. People want the helpful planning that's in a will. So they want the helpful planning, but they want to avoid probate. And if you want to do both, that's why some people turn to a trust. So now there's lots of types of trusts, and we're already 20 minutes into a 25 minute show. And so I can't get into all of them. But you should at least consider that these tools are available to you. It's like it's like going to the hardware store and the only thing you see on the shelf is a screwdriver. So you pick the screwdriver. But if you just walk around the other aisle, there's a power drill sitting there that could really get a job done faster. Right. And so you ought to know what these what these tools are. Um, check out the information that we have on our website, secularlawfirm.com. Come to one of our live workshops, come to one of our live webinars, watch one of our pre-recorded shows. Uh, and I think that you'll find that uh, these are some really interesting tools and you ought to consider them. So we use trusts. Uh, one type of trust is a revocable living trust. This is the most common type of trust that people use, a revocable living trust. And so generally speaking, what a trust is, is an agreement between a couple of people, the creator of the trust and then 
the person who's going to manage the trust. That's called the trustee, the person who's in control. And then the people who have access, those people are called the beneficiaries of the trust. So the person who creates it is called, we call that person the grantor. And then the person who's in control is the trustee. And then the person who can use the stuff, those people are called beneficiaries. Now, in some trusts, I want to be all three people. I want to put my stuff in this trust. I want to be in control of my own money. And I want to use the money whenever I want. If you have 100% control and you have 100% access, what we're talking about is something called a revocable living trust. Revocable. So the idea is I can put this into this trust, uh, and if I ever wanted to terminate the trust and get my stuff back, I can do that. Or I can mend it in, in any way I want. I can change who gets an inheritance. I can change everything about it. And so that's a revocable living trust. The primary use of a revocable living trust is essentially to re replace the will. It does the same thing that the will does when I pass away, except that trusts uh, are not required to go through probate. They skip the trip to the courthouse. They skip some headache. They typically skip some expense uh, and can just be a better tool to one, avoid the courthouse process, but also do the more comprehensive for your, uh, planning for your family. So a revocable living trust is a tool that you could consider if uh, if you want to do uh, the comprehensive planning for your family and keep them out of the courthouse once you pass away. There are also irrevocable trusts. Now, an irrevocable trust is a trust that, as the name implies, cannot be revoked. Now, within the general category of irrevocable trust, there are lots of different types of trust. And those trusts are used for different purposes, and we're not going to do them all today. But here's what I want you to leave with. I want you to, to understand that just because a trust is irrevocable doesn't mean it's inflexible. It doesn't mean you can't change anything. When I do my workshop, I ask people, you know, these, I'll say these trusts are irrevocable. What does that mean? And people say, once I do it, I can't change anything. No, 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 no. That's not what it means. If it meant you couldn't change anything, we'd make up a word called irrechangeable. It would be an irrechangeable trust. It's not an irrechangeable trust. It's an irrevocable trust, not revocable trust. And if you look at that word, all it really means is you cannot revoke the document. You can't assign one sheet of paper and get your assets back. You give up access to your assets. Well, okay, fine. I can change some things in this trust, but I can't revoke it. So if I can't get my stuff back with the typical irrevocable trust, you're not going to be a beneficiary of trust principles. So if you put in some assets, you put in your home, you put in some money, you can never own those assets again. Why would I want to do that? Why would I give up money to my own, uh, give up access to my own money? And the answer is because if I can't get the money, neither can the bad guys. Who are the bad guys? Creditor issues, lawsuit issues, long-term care issues. If I want to protect my stuff from a nursing home, for example, I ought to consider an irrevocable trust, a trust that I cannot revoke. Because if I could revoke it, that means on my own accord, I could sign a piece of paper, I revoke my trust, and I want my stuff back. And the name of the game in asset protection is if I can get it, they can get it. So if I could revoke the trust, that means it's available for them. That's why you see a lot of families going to irrevocable trusts because they want to protect stuff from the nursing home. They want to protect their hard-earned savings. They want to protect their house. They want to make sure their wife has a place to sleep. They want to make sure the kids are going to get an inheritance. They didn't work 50 years accumulating assets to lose it all to a long-term care event. And so you may end up considering an irrevocable trust. Right? If you want to learn more, happy to talk to you about it, happy to give you a consultation, happy to invite you to one of our upcoming workshops, which you can find them all at secularlawfirm.com. Now, in our closing minutes, I just want to uh, do one more uh, frequently asked question. And people ask me, aren't trusts for rich people? Like, I associate the word trust with rich people, right? Well, historically, rich people do use trusts. Uh, and when we're talking about rich people using trusts, what we're really talking about is attempting to protect assets from taxes. But see, middle-class Americans, by and large, don't have tax problems. We don't have big federal estate tax problems. They only tax really wealthy people. They don't tax middle-class people on the way out. Pennsylvania does, but it's a relatively light tax for families with kids, and that's where the money's going. It's a 4.5% tax. 
But trusts aren't just for rich people. Tax trusts might be for wealthy people because they have tax problems. But for the rest of us, trusts are more about providing comprehensive planning for our family, perhaps protecting assets from things like long-term care expenses. If you want to learn more about the use of trusts, come to one of our upcoming workshops. Remember, folks, this Life and Legacy show is about education and entertainment. It is not about legal advice. You are not my client, and you should not make decisions about your family and your money based on what you heard on this or any other radio show. If you'd like to more, learn more, come to secularlawfirm.com, and I thank you for listening.